Who is ready for our first talk of the day? Oh, man. So if you go across the river to downtown Portland along the Max Line, you will see sculptures erected in honor of this speaker. Known as the Green Man of Portland, this speaker has been responsible for fantastical hallucinations in people for decades. He manifests as a small green archer, and when he shoots you with an arrow, your whole worldview changes. You see flowers growing from people's head, kindness where it wasn't there before, and occasionally you spot a celestial white stag. It's truly a magical experience to be in this speaker's presence, so I'm very excited to share him with you. He is Jan de Vries. Thank you. Best introduction ever, I guess. Um, okay, um, anti-fragility and DevOps, getting closer and to Hydra and high heels. Who is familiar with anti-fragility? Can, can you show me hands? Uh, show oh, okay, okay, only a few people. We are gonna change that in the next uh, 30 minutes. My name is uh, Jan de Vries, I'm from uh, the Netherlands. And um, to give you an idea of the size of the country, I wrapped it around Portland, and then it looks like this. So yes, it's a small country. Um, yeah, um, I've been in Dev for many years. I've been in Ops, organizing Ops for uh, many years, and um, I've been connecting Dev and Ops uh, in uh, in the last four or five years. And. This is actually what worries me. Increasing complexity, although we uh, keep simplifying, it keeps getting complex again. Uh, projects, uh, they keep disturbing dev and ops. Um, silos, uh, they keep popping up actually. It's hard to get rid of them. Um, command and control management, still there. And culture in general. I uh, attended two discussions about uh, culture yesterday, and uh, yeah, I, I'll actually notice the same problems that I see in a lot of enterprises that uh, I visit. Um, so I wanted to, uh, when I was thinking of, of uh, when I was working in DevOps, I just noticed how much power DevOps has. So I was wondering what is actually the power in DevOps, what is actually under the hood? What is actually in that DevOps sports car? So with DevOps, we can, we can, uh, we can actually race through uh, a digital, digital transforming world at high speed, but what is actually under the hood? And the, the V12 engine is actually anti-fragility. So I wanted to get my head around it, and it was pretty difficult. Because those books, Anti-Fragile, who read the book Anti-Fragile? You did. One, one, two. Two people. Was it difficult? Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, um, I, I, read it, uh, I read it twice. Uh, it, it, was, it was very difficult. And actually, all the other books uh, uh, Taleb wrote are also very difficult books. Um, uh, sometimes you think you understand three, four pages, and then you read the fifth page, you think, okay, that was not right, start again, uh, f f uh, uh, f five pages before that. So the Black Swan is, is also a very difficult book. Um, so uh, the book is difficult, that's, that's one hard thing. Um, the, the writer, Taleb, Nassim Nicholas Taleb, is actually, uh, actually, I think he's too brilliant to understand. If, if you look at videos from him at, at YouTube, it's, it's very, Difficult to follow him at at uh, at, uh, at, at at length, um, and um, the last thing is that is what anti-fragility means for uh, for DevOps is actually counterintuitive because when a change is risky, we normally go to the left. We say, okay, make change hard uh, because they are risky. We have to make changes hard, uh, but at the same time, we are, are actually suppressing volatility. So the risks are still there but they are not visible. And um, at the same time, that means actually that we are building fragile systems. So we should actually go to the right 
uh, and make changes easy. That's what we do at DevOps, of course, and bring the pain forward, minimize the risks. And what we do then is actually building anti-fragile systems. This is the kind of graphs that um, Talib uses in his uh, book. Uh, just a variable, increasing or decreasing, and uh, it will go towards pain or gain. And we are not looking at this linear stuff or this linear stuff. No, we are looking at something with a symmetry. Um, I will show you three aspects from the book about symmetry. Um, and the first one is non-linearity. And actually what the definition that he uses is says, okay, if anything has more upside than downside from random events or shocks, it is anti-fragile. And all the rest, the reverse, is fragile. And to judge the fragility or the anti-fragility of a system is to ask, ask whether it, it is accelerating towards pain or gain. So, this is actually, if you increase this variable, it accelerates towards pain. If you decrease this variable, it, it accelerates towards gain. So what would this be? Would this be fragile or anti-fragile? If you decrease the variable, it accelerates towards pain. If you increase the variable, it accelerates towards pain. So whatever happens, it accelerates towards pain. So it is actually fragile. It likes to be in the middle where it is safe. But as soon as you start to move a variable, it accelerates towards pain. And the other one is actually something, a variable, and we will go in detail later, but uh, actually a variable, if you increase it or decrease it, it doesn't matter because it always will accelerate towards gain. So it actually, the, the right one loves shocks because every shock to the left or to the right means it will gain. Um, and maybe you can remember that from uh, math class, the left one is called concave and the right one is called convex. Okay. But you don't know where you are because we saw the blue dots and maybe we uh, would, would increase or decrease, but we could also be at the yellow dots. We don't know. We, what we have to do, we have to tinker, we have to try. Tinkering is a very important word in the book of, uh, of, uh, of Talib. You have to know where you are. You have to tinker to find it out. And to uh, just remember if something is fragile or anti-fragile, just think of the frown. The frown is fragile, the, uh, and the anti-fragile uh, one is, of course, a, a smile. An IT example. Suppose you are, uh, you're, you have the, uh, the, the variable, the number of deployments per month and you're not deploying anything because it's, it's, it's a very stable system, it's an old system, it's back, back off back of a system, you don't have to change a lot in it. Um, and um, well, that means, means actually there's no trouble, you will be happy. Uh, but as soon as you start to increase the number of deployments per month, you will go towards pain. But as soon as you keep increasing it, it will, in the end, will it, uh, accelerate towards gain. So actually, what this says is continuous deployment is actually anti-fragile, and we already knew that, of course. Another one is the number of tasks coordinated in a project. If I do not co coordinate anything, it would be a chaos, so it would be pain, but as soon as I start to coordinate, coordinate th uh, tasks, I will accelerate uh, towards uh, toward gain, but uh, at the same time, when I keep adding tasks in that project, in the end, and I will go over the top and it will uh, accelerate again towards, uh, towards pain. So what you actually could say is projects, especially software projects, are fragile. And we already knew that, of course, also. Um, when you ask for people uh, to, uh, what, the, what the opposite is of fragile, they normally do not 
mention the word anti-fragile because a lot of people don't know the word anti-fragile. It, it only was coined by Taleb in 2012 and before that the word didn't even exist. So if you ask people for the opposites, they say, okay, it's robust or resilient. Um, and to, um, to uh, give you an idea of what the difference is, um, a fragile system actually breaks from the very beginning. So this is actually an optimistic view of a system. The robust system, it will, it will keep up longer, but in the end it will break, especially when it encounters, encounters a black swan, uh, referring to the other book of, uh, of uh, Taleb. And then we have, of course, the resilient system that will break down, but it will come back to the level where it started, but it will not get better than it was. That's resilient. And the anti-fragile one, actually, it loves shocks. It gets, it, it's getting better with every shock. <coughs> Some real life examples, this is fragile. Every shock is too much. This is super fragile. Every shock is too much. But this is also fragile. And why? Why is agile fragile? Because... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's, 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 it's easy to understand, or to, to remember, I mean. Um, um, it's it's uh, because um, the, the potentially shippable increment, you don't bring it to production immediately. So you are accumulating changes. So you are accumulating risks. So, actually, what you could say, agile alone is fragile. This is, you call, could call this robust. This is also robust, Unix. <coughs> and this is resilient. This is uh, the phoenix. You may, uh, you may uh, recognize uh, the bird that uh, actually rises from the ashes of its predecessor. So it will always rise, you can never kill it, but it will not, not get better than it was. <coughs> and this is also resilient, an aircraft. When an electrical system fails, there's a backup uh, electrical system. Uh, when a vacuum system fails, there's a hydraulic backup system, etc., etc. So it is multi, multi re, re, resilient, actually. <coughs> and this is actually uh, the best example of something anti-fragile. This is the hydra, also from the Greek mythology. Um, if you cut off the head of a hydra, it immediately grows back two heads. So with every attack, it gets stronger. So the question could be how to become less fragile, even anti-fragile in IT. That's something we would like to do. And then you have to look at uh, what, uh, what the subtitle is of the book of, uh, of Taleb. And he actually say, says anti-fragile is about things that gain from disorder. So you want to introduce disorder in your system. You want to introduce stress. You want to introduce change. And you could do that, for instance, by continuous deployment. Because continuous deployment is putting stress on your system all the time, permanently. That's actually what you want. That is uh, generating anti-fragility. Uh, same for uh, canary releases, A-B testing, uh, auto-scaling, uh, chaos engineering, all those things introduce stress, measure stress, re respond to stress. That's actually what you, uh, what you want. And chaos engineering. Um, I think most of you uh, know the chaos monkey, um, um, in, in, invented by, uh, by Netflix and in, in, at the same time uh, 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 open source. Is anybody applying the chaos monkey in his own company? Ah, one, one hand, I see, yeah, okay. Um, and at the same time, the, um, the chaos monkey, there were uh, other monkeys introduced, like uh, the latency monkey, which uh, introduces uh, at artificial uh, latency. Uh, the generator monkey uh, switching off, uh, uh, switching off uh, instances that are not being used. Uh, conformity monkey uh, and even the chaos gorilla, because Netflix became immune to the chaos monkey. So they had to introduce a chaos gorilla. Uh, to make sure that it still worked in the direction of anti-fragility. And uh, in the end, they, uh, they, it all comes together in one 
army of, uh, of uh, monkeys, the simian army. And this is, a, this is actually uh, an, an official job title. Uh, you can apply for uh, the title of uh, senior chaos engineer. Yeah. Okay, uh, second aspect of asymmetry, uh, it's optionality. If you read this definition, I'll let you read this definition. And if you do that, I, I think that most of you are thinking about something financial. So, and that's, that's true. Uh, one of the, uh, one of the uh, possibilities is a financial op op option, and they are usually expensive. But at the same time, uh, non-financial options are usually free or uh, very uh, cheap, uh, but we don't recognize them. Um, and if you are anti-fragile, if you are anti-fragile, and, and remember the smile, every tinkering what you do, every change you do is actually generating gain. If you are anti-fragile, you can just tinker and, and, and uh, yeah, uh, experiment, and actually all the outliers will be positive if you are anti-fragile. And of course, one of uh, a good example is the Unicorn Club, uh, the club of uh, startups that uh, reached a valuation of one billion dollars. Um, and what, what actually what uh, Taub says, you don't have to lecture these birds how to fly. They just tinker, and they are just able to uh, to to uh, move to the next uh, minimum viable product that works uh, for uh, for the customers. And we already knew that, of course, because who, who, were, who read the Phoenix project? I think only 20% of the people. I, I think you should, everybody should read the Phoenix project. It's, when, you, when you start reading it, you think, okay, this is about my company. This is really about my company, if you start reading it. <coughs> very, uh, a very uh, good book, I think. And the third way, there's, there are uh, 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 three ways in the book, and the third way is about continual experimentation, actually also about uh, tinkering, continual experimentation and, uh, and learning. If you are fragile, then it's not a good idea to tinker, because, remember the frown, all the outliers will be negative. And then what you could use is what uh, Talib in his book uh, mentions, uh, he mentions it, uh, he calls it uh, the via negativa. Um, and actually what he says is to become anti-fragile is to first decrease, uh, decrease uh, the downside of the uh, company or a system. So things, people, action, habits, systems that make you uh, vulnerable to volatility and risk, you have to get rid of that uh, kind of things before you can really tinker. So what you want to do is you want to get rid of the, the lower part of those outliers. And via negativa in IT um, means actually, uh, and you, there are different sources, but for instance, you could, uh, you could watch the Spotify videos. Who watched the Spotify videos? Only a few people, okay. If you, if you uh, search on, on, on YouTube, Spotify, um, um, and, and also followed by, uh, by Nieberg, uh, the one who is uh, actually uh, talking in, that, uh, in those videos, um, you see a lot of uh, best practices uh, from uh, uh, Spotify. And what I, what I say is uh, uh, get rid of handoffs, get rid of politics, get rid of fear, get rid of ego. That's all learnings from, uh, from, uh, from Spotify. And something you also should get rid of is technical debt. Um, and Gene Kim, for, uh, as far as I know, he gave, gave actually the best definition there is. Uh, technical, debt, technical debt is what you feel the next time you want to make a change. So it's all the quick and dirty things that you uh, have done in the past and that, that you did not clean, clean up, actually. And uh, the last one is, uh, is inequalities between the MTTR and MTBF, the mean time to repair and the mean time between failure. We come back to that in, the, in a minute. But first, technical debt. Uh, I often use this um, visual 
uh, also uh, or even at management teams and the board of directors to um, uh, ask for um, 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 yeah, understanding actually of, uh, of technical debt because the uh, I switch to this one first. Uh, the yellow one is actually about the, the defect backlog. The blue one is the product backlog. And actually, my customer is only interested in blue and yellow. That's what he sees. That's what he wants. He wants his functionality added and he wants to get rid of the defects. But if you do that, you see that you, in the end, at the sixth sprint, you will drown in defects. So, you have, to, uh, you have to explain to management teams and even board of directors, there are more uh, backlogs. The red one is the technical debt backlog, and the green one is the improvement backlog, for, is, for instance, test automation. So, if you uh, put red and green on top of yellow, that will, be, that will uh, enable you to manage down your yellow or to uh, manage down actually your uh, defects. But of course you have to uh, bite the bullet first because if you add red and green on top of yellow at the fifth or the sixth sprint, there will be no blue left anymore. So it will be a refactoring sprint. MTTR and MTBF. What is in your company um, the most important thing to, uh, to, to keep in mind is that the mean time between failure or the mean time to repair. Can I, can I, can I see hands for the mean time to repair? And the mean time between failure? Oh, okay. So a lot of, a lot of hands for MTTR. And that's a good, uh, good thing because, um, um, sorry. And that's a, yeah, that's a good thing because empty, uh, if you focus on the mean time between failure, um, it actually makes you fragile. Because uh, John Allspaw said, um, MTBF is only for space hardware and for embedded medical devices. That's the only, uh, that are the only two areas where MTBF is important. And for all the rest, all the other software, all the other systems, MTTR is most important. Last one, a symmetry, uh, a symmetry aspect is transferring fragility and for DevOps it's a very important one. Um, the definition coming from the book again is if one party has the downside and another party has the upside, fragil fragility is being transferred from one party to another and the reverse of that is skin in the game. So that you that for instance dev has skin in the game of ops or ops has a skin in the game of uh, of dev, um, and it means skin in the game means a person has something to lose in a given situation. Um, if you have silos, then skin in the game is missing. So dev is missing skin in the game of ops and ops uh, in uh, in the game of uh, of, uh, of dev. So. Yeah, actually what you could say is that silos are fragilizers. And we already knew that, of course. Um, skin in the game is also missing in projects. Because if you look at uh, the definition of a, uh, of a project from uh, Prince2, it is actually talking about a temporary organization. And there is nothing as bad uh, as a temporary organization organization for software, because software is not temporary. So you should not use any temporary projects to, uh, to, uh, to deliver software. And the project model also leads to chasing data over benefit, chasing time over benefit, chasing cost over benefit, and chasing features over benefit. Um, actually, um, what the project does is uh, actually measuring benefits and initial costs and not looking at operational costs. Um, and 
uh, this is a quote actually of, uh, of Alan Kelly. Alan Kelly uh, is, uh, is he, there's also a lot of videos from, uh, from him on, uh, on YouTube. On YouTube. Um, he says actually the most destructive idea known to software development is temporary or organizations because disbanding, disbanding teams destroys knowledge, capability and performance. So you should work with um, stable teams. So projects are also fragilizers. What you want to do is you want to go from a project-based based organization where everything that a project has been built, has built in the, in the past, is put into the operations environment as a sort of chaos. And you want towards stable teams, uh, permanent teams that uh, are doing dev and ops, so there's no chaos in the operations environment here. <coughs> so DevOps is still evolving and accelerating. That's what, uh, what we actually see. But in what direction is it uh, evolving and accelerating? I like to use the nine square model. Um, a strategic, uh, tactic and operational layer and three columns, business and technology. And in the middle there is the information column. And the information column is actually specifying what the business wants towards technology and is supporting that technology towards the business. And I like to use a gearbox uh, to, uh, to, to, to make clear that all those squares have to work together to make a company work. And DevOps, in most companies, I think maybe in 90, 95% of all the companies, DevOps starts here, in the lower right corner, operational level and in the tech column. And as soon as you, um, as, you, as you start deploying DevOps in an organization, um, you need to connect to that information col column and to connect to your business. And you also want to connect to that tactical level. So it is, DevOps is actually pushing towards the uh, upper left corner. And at the same time, uh, more and more businesses are realizing how important IT is. They start pulling. Uh, actually, uh, they are st starting pulling towards, uh, towards the IT, towards DevOps. So the best thing that can happen is that you can uh, combine that push and push, uh, combine that push and pull uh, effort and uh, make it work together uh, to make sure that DevOps actually uh, moves towards the rest of the organization. <coughs> we already saw this, don't lecture birds how to fly. What I see in companies is that the strategic and the te tactical level in the IT column is getting less important. The operational level the, is working more and more autonomous. Uh, so you don't have to lecture those DevOps birds how to fly. And at the same time, uh, you, can, uh, you can see it uh, at this uh, periodic uh, table of DevOps uh, tools. Um, and you may remember that uh, the, the, the way it is, uh, is uh, uh, put over here. You can re maybe remember it from, uh, from school. Um, but this periodic table of DevOps tools, there are a lot of tools in this uh, view that were actually not the result of a strategic plan. They were, they, uh, they were developed by tinkering, actually. And the last one, the last arrow is this one, is that you see uh, a lot of automation what, what actually um, is um, uh, 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 what actually uh, a lo lot of operational business and even a lot of tactical business parts of an organization are actually disappearing. So if, if you look in a bank or an insurance company, uh, you see that 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 the the, the the business teams, the operational business teams, uh, they do not longer exist or only exist for 5 or 10 percent. And the rest is automated, actually. <coughs> so if you look at the resulting shape, it's actually a high heel, what you see. So it's a very, uh, a very small part left on the operational and the technical uh, level. Uh, and actually, the, the, the bigger part is actually the devil's part within, within IT, which is actually linking to the other big part and that's in the upper left corner at a strategic business. <coughs> and 
And when you are looking for something to connect those two, uh, to those two corners, uh, you could, for instance, look at uh, a bezel next, and I put uh, I put uh, a link at the bottom of uh, of the of the slide. Uh, a bezel next helps you helps actually uh, the upper left corner to start with that particular pull. So uh, you can push from the DevOps side, and you can uh, use bezel next to uh, generate that pull from the upper left corner. <coughs> So my advice for IT um, would be to watch the Spotify videos, um, read the Phoenix project, uh, reduce your technical debt, uh, reduce your MTTR, that's an important one, uh, get rid of silos and projects as much as possible, um, start tinkering, um, release your chaos monkey when you're um, when, you, when you think it, uh, it is uh, the, the time for that, of course. And also an important one is ensure that in individuals that make decisions in your company have skin in the game. Because a lot of management has no skin in the game. They have nothing to lose uh, as a result of that particular decisions that they make. So this is, is for IT. Uh, an advice for your business these two books uh, can help you uh, to can help your business to think more anti-fragile. Uh, so I think most of the business they will they will not start reading the Phoenix project or they will not start reading anti-fragile from uh, from Talib. But these two uh, books help to help your business to think more anti-fragile. <coughs> um, an advice for business and IT: um, you could. For instance, you could uh, use uh, the theory of constraints. Um, and what is your biggest constraint? That is something that you could, uh, that you, uh, that you could think of. Is it, uh, in this particular uh, situation, is it your DevOps part of your company? Or is it your, uh, your Bizzle part of your company? Or actually your, your business part, your, IT, uh, your information column? And referring to that uh, nine square model. So actually, uh, theory of constraints, you could use that all over the company and just think, is this a, are we, is our biggest constraint at this particular moment, is that uh, something into DevOps or is it something in, uh, in the business? <coughs> um, an uh, advice for you, uh, if you would, would like to get more anti-fragile, uh, you could uh, go to gettingstronger.org, and actually, that's a, a site about uh, hormesis. And hormesis is actually the biological form of antifragility. So uh, it's it, it's actually uh, there is a lot of uh, information uh, about uh, how you could get more antifragile uh, biological wise. <coughs> but um, as soon as you think. Uh, maybe as a result of this particular presentation, that you would like to change something in your organization, there is always the cuckoo effect. That Drucker already coined, any foreign innovation in a corporation will stimulate the corporate immune system to create antibodies that destroy it. Always. So the cuckoo effect is always there. <coughs> and also remember that uh, Actually, where the magic, magic happens is not where your comfort zone is in most cases. And I would like to uh, close with this particular slide. Keep comms and DevOps. That was my presentation. <coughs> mm. Any questions? We, have we can do two questions. Yeah? Do you have a copy of your slides available? Uh, would you have a website or uh, yeah, I think uh, the organization will, uh, will provide you with, uh, with uh, the, pr the presentations. Is that right, uh, Alice? Right? Sorry, say that again? Uh, the, the question was, will the presentation, yes, will the slides uh, be available? Yeah, um, yeah. If, if you want to post your slides online, we'll grab those. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> Otherwise, all of the talks are being recorded and will be posted on our YouTube channel. Yeah. Another question? 
I see no hands. No. All right, another round of applause for the Green Man of Portland. <laughs>